Good morning. It's good to see you again. Uh, this is, uh, in theory, going to be for Friday uh, of next week. And so I wanted to make sure you understand that we may not get to the end of the book of Revelation. Of course, you're always welcome to read it on your own time. I hope that you will see how the story ends, see what it's like for uh, those of us going to heaven to be there. And so today we're going to look at Revelation 18, which is the fall of civilization. We saw the pieces all put into place in chapter 17, where the Antichrist is using the great prostitute, which is the world's culture, in order to spread his influence so that he could have a one-world government. Here in chapter 18, now that he's got the power, we're going to see how that power implodes under the sovereignty of God. Let's pray. Father, as we look at Revelation 18, I pray that you will bless my students with insight, that they would understand your word, that they would rejoice because you are the sovereign God. You have always been seated on the throne, and nobody will ever remove you from that place. You are greater than great, more awesome than the awesomest, and you're more beautiful than description could ever imagine. I can't wait to see you, that my eyes will be open, and I will know you even as I am fully known that with all the capacity that you give to me, I would know my God, whom I adore and cherish. I can't wait. I love you. I love my students too. May you bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I know you have your Bible open to Revelation chapter 18. You've also downloaded your notes and have printed them out. Uh, this is the fall of civilization. One thing to watch for as you go through this chapter is how often that John uses the phrase, one hour, one hour, one hour. He may not be talking about 60 minutes, but he's talking about the fact that this is such a short duration. Whatever power is achieved, it's only being achieved for one purpose, and that's God's. And so even if it seems like, oh, crud, this guy got elected, or this guy is now a power, he's a dictator, he took over our country, relax. It's only for an hour. It's a short period of time. So in chapter 18, verse 1, we find that there is another angel coming down from heaven. He has great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And notice that he pronounces the fall of Babylon the Great. We just saw how Babylon the Great was carried by the Antichrist and by his growing government so that the whole world was influenced by this culture. But then we find out that Babylon the Great, that great prostitute, has fallen. We saw her come to power in chapter 17, verse 5. But when he says, fallen, fallen, it indicates both the lament and the glee of the observer. Like, I would hate to see world culture collapse. There's a lot of things that our culture does pretty good, I think. But there is so much evil that is perpetrated by our culture, and you're aware of it. You've been the victims of some of this evil. Uh, there's glee that this is finally over with, and there's also sorrow that this is over with. The prophecy back in chapter 14, verse 8, that said that the Babylon, that the culture of this world would fall, has taken place. In verse 2, the masks are off. And so the culture and the civilization is revealed to be a false front for demons and unclean spirits and detestable things, as you see there in verse 2. What the world? We didn't think that's what the culture was about. Absolutely. Satan used the culture in order to spread in a very beautiful, loving, entertaining way his anti-God message. In verse 3, we find that the government, which would be composed of nations and kings, has collapsed. These were unfaithful to God in his God-given mandate to serve him as they serve the people. Romans 13, chapter uh, 13, verses 1 and following. We also see that the merchants have also collapsed. The economy, which is so used to selling and buying and so forth, the excessive luxuries of commercialism has taken a mighty fall. You can compare this to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, where greed is linked to idolatry. Our greed for possessions has caused us to make a god of possessions. It's not unlike the situation we're going through right now, where the unemployment is huge, businesses are shut down, and social distancing, and 10 people and less, and so forth, have caused these businesses to shut down, and maybe shut down for good. Maybe they're going to go out of business. McDonald's will probably still be there. But my point is, is that we're already getting a glimpse of this. I don't know if this is the end. I don't think it is, but I'm not exactly sure yet. Let me keep my eye on it. We'll see what happens. My point is, is that the economy will be a collapsing thing when Babylon falls. Verse 4, we find out that for the people of God, we're supposed to come out from her. We're not supposed to enjoy the culture the way that the world does. God's people must be sanctified or set apart 
in verse 4. They must not behave like unbelievers because we're not unbelievers. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the present tense, which means that right now believers should be coming out from among them. We should not wait till later to practice holiness. If you are a Christian, do not give in to Babylon. Do not get your citizenship in Babylon. Don't have a passport that has the world culture as your homeland. Come out from her now. Be holy, be set apart, be different from what the world is telling you to do. In verse 6, we find out that God uses civilization's own cup against her. She has taken this cup and has made the nations drink the wine of her immorality. And God says, time for you to have a taste of your own medicine. A double portion equals what her cup is. It's full of adulteries, the scripture says, everything vile and impurities. Isn't that interesting? Because that's what she was peddling to the world in chapter 17, verse 2 and verse 4. We also find out that it's her cup, that's one portion, and the other portion is God's, which is filled with wrath. Revelation 14, 10. So God is pouring out upon her. Here, drink the dregs of your poison, girl. And then we find that God says, and here's the drink of my wrath. There's your double portion. You're going to suffer from your own purveyance. And now you're going to suffer the just wrath of God. Society reaps what it sows. Look what pornography does to marriage. Look what happens when uh, we have question marks about what constitutes gender and what constitutes life. Um, uh, laws about abortion, legalized drugs, human trafficking, public mass shootings. All of these things have uh, an effect on the culture, on society, and especially on the family. Whatever you think about such things, you need to know that it has an effect. It's not innocent. There's nothing really that has a, 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 a neutral effect on people. It's going to affect you positively or negatively. God's wrath addresses what society sowed against him. His word has never changed. It irritates the starch out of people. It is what it is. I'm going to tell you what the word says. You can take it or leave it. I can't control that. But it is my job to announce to you, thus says the Lord. In verse 7, note the use of luxury or luxuries. When I think about this, our, uh, one of our greatest um, hindrances to our walk in Christ is the things that we own. We have um, advertising out there that says, you deserve this. You deserve to have this. Shouldn't you be driving this? Shouldn't you own a house here? Shouldn't you have this kind of account? Shouldn't you have these kind of luxuries? You deserve it. That's what advertising tells us. I know that what I deserve, what, 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 what I myself deserve, is a eternity in hell separated from a holy God. I will not get what I deserve, and that's only by grace. I will get forgiveness. I have forgiveness. I have reconciliation. I have a home with Him and an eternity to know Him. I don't deserve any of that. I don't deserve anything except hell, and I'm getting what I don't deserve. Amen. Verse 9, we find out that this all comes down in the span of one day. It indicates a brief time span. It won't take long for civilization to collapse. It's already unwieldy as is. Chapter 18, verses 10 and 11 uses the phrase, it'll be one hour until it all comes down to nothing. We also find out in verses 11 through 13 that there's all kinds of cargoes that sit at the docks and there's nobody buying them. How many stores are lamenting that right now? Like nobody buys our stuff anymore. Uh, the cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, human souls. Yikes, Arama. Do we really make a practice of selling people? Yeah, human trafficking. Still a thing after all these centuries. So much for progress, right? We find out that these types of cargoes reveal a taste for the finest things of the culture and people and slaves. Verses 17 through 19, we find out that transportation and its infrastructure is in ruins. No one is going anywhere. They're not buying what would be shipped, even if it could be transported. This might be a preview of coming attractions these last couple weeks in 2020. We also find in verse 20 that God judges civilization for the way that she treated his servants and his people. That's why I'm saying when you hear a warning in scripture saying, Come out from Babylon, my people, be separate from her, be holy unto me. 
we, if you're a Christian, please take that seriously. Because we find out that God is collapsing the civilization for how that civilization treats his people. But if you're part of, uh, of the ones that enjoy that culture, maybe you won't be set apart from her by God in judgment because you would not separate yourself from her in life. Maybe you're actually a part of her. Maybe you are Babylon. What kinds of things are included in Babylon? If you look at verses 21 and following, you'll find that uh, verse 22, the sounds of harpists and musicians, so the music industry, uh, milling, which would be farming, refining, which is processing, uh, the arts and manufacturing, uh, the power grid, uh, light and so forth will be put out, um, uh, systems that keep the society running, energy, uh, water, sewage, those kind of things. Um, merchants. Merchants are the heroes of a consumer-driven society. There are actually people that were named J.C. Penney and Abercrombie and Fitch and so forth. I don't know if anyone was named Gap, but uh, there probably was somebody named Victoria, if you smell what I'm cooking. My point is this, is that the merchants were the heroes of the culture then, and they are today. We like to wear the uh, appropriate name, and people are loyal to a certain brands and so forth. But take a look at verse 24. In her, in Babylon, was found the prophets of, or excuse me, the blood of the prophets and the saints and all those who have been slain of the earth. She enjoyed drinking the blood of God's saints. And martyrs matter to God more than we could ever imagine. So many people for the name of a dollar have been sold. So many churches for the sake of shutting off their message have been censored. So many Christians have been killed because they would not bow to another God. Brothers and sisters, we're going to have to make up our mind. We're going to have to come out from this culture. We can still speak to it. We're still going to live in this civilization. But we cannot let Babylon be our God. We have a God, and it's not her. Our God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's coming again. Come out from among her, my people, I beg you. Come out from among Babylon, lest we be judged right alongside of her. God bless you all. Follow Jesus Christ.